Hello, and thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Creedal Catholic. Creedal Catholic is a Catholic theology and apologetics podcast that is faithful to the magisterium and dedicated to the mission of the new evangelization. We're a part of the Vernacular Podcast Network, and if you'd like to support us or find out more about the other shows on our network, head to patreon.com slash vpn or vernacularpodcast.com. Patreon.com slash vpn or vernacularpodcast.com. Enjoy the show. Okay, I'm back with part two of my interview with Paul McCusker. This is where the interview, I don't, I don't want to say the first interview wasn't interesting, but I really enjoyed this part of the interview because we talk about doing catechesis better. We talk about uh, some of Paul's ideas about the development of language. Uh, we talk about how he is now trying to help the Augustine Institute tell stories better and reach the Uh, reach the Catholic family through stories because they're very engaging. So this is Paul's bread and butter because this is what he's done his entire adult life. And he's been very good at it because Adventures in Odyssey, I think, is 800 episodes strong now. And I listened to hundreds of them growing up. And uh, it really was a a critical part of my formation. So if we can bring that model into the Catholic Church, this will be really fantastic. So I'm excited about the work that the Augustine Institute is doing and excited to let Paul share that with you as well. Everything about a high church Anglican experience is so Catholic, yeah. even down to the wording, that it wasn't as big a leap as it might have been had I tried to go from Baptist to Catholic. Yeah, it's pretty familiar being in a, in a Mass yeah. after being in the Episcopal Church for 10 years. And I still have prayer books from then. I'm yeah, sure. I have access. I still have memorized. Do you, by the way, have the St. Gregory? I do. Okay. I just got yeah. that last week, actually, which it, is, is it, beautiful. Is nice? And the familiarity of it is is nice. Yeah. And, and I will say if I have, no, it's not a regret. Um, I'm just sorry that so much of the Catholic liturgy is clunky. Yeah. That the translation from the Latin or wherever it came from, uh, was not written to be spoken in English the way we do. Whereas of course the, the book of common prayer comes out of an age of Shakespeare, right? Exactly. You know, and it's, it's no surprise to me. I always found it interesting that with the Reformation, Europe itself, um, you were dealing with uh, the Reformation and Catholicism playing itself out through images, statues and painting, Mm -hmm. stained glass Mm -hmm. and all that. But in England, uh, you don't think of too many Renaissance painters. painters. You're thinking of words. Words, yeah. And it was a word-based culture. The King James Bible and Shakespeare, everything is word-based. And so the beauty of the Book of Common Prayer is in its word and the phrasing. And it was written, I I actually heard a lecture about the poetry of it, that the translation and the way they actually did psalms and some of the phrasing is meant to be spoken out loud and has a beauty to it in in its rhythm and cadence and everything that you just don't necessarily believe that the interpreters, you know, when they were translating some of the Catholic liturgy sure, yeah. that they were thinking, uh, I'm, I'm almost certain that's got to be true for the New American Bible, Oh yeah, which is about as clunky as yeah. it can be. Um, and, and so I could say that's a disappointment. I wish our, our wording was as beautiful as Cranmer and the gang got it for the Book of Common Prayer. Yeah, I have a lot of those prayers that are that still stick in my memory and sometimes will just pop in my head, you know, like, uh, yeah. we do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting mm-hmm. in our own goodness yeah. but in thy manifold and great mercies i mean it's just it's oh, beautiful yeah, yeah. stuff all, all, all yeah. hearts are open all yeah. desires known and from i mean all of that is 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 gorgeous but you know it's funny historically then when you follow it when you think of the founders of this country you had along the west and in the south mm-hmm. you had the hispanic right you know from spain and all of them coming through with image base representation of the faith doing it that way but then you kind of come in through new england and into jamestown and all of that and what do you have as a word based? That's so interesting. So it's yeah. not it's not a surprise to me that the Bible would become the center point, even though historically it. Well, and then, been. and then why why mainline Protestantism had its home in New York and yeah. Boston and Philadelphia and D.C. Right, because right. it was an the extension east, the northeastern of seaboard. The yeah. word being written words, right? The King James Bible and everything centered around a proclamation of the word in the services. That is fascinating. Whereas yeah. ours is. Not the word, even though we have more scripture reading in the mass than, than most Protestant, Protestant church, churches yeah. do, but uh, maybe not taught well, but we have sure. it. But we have the Eucharist, yeah. and it's not word based as in written word symbols on a page. Right. It is something completely different. Right, and I think people uh, that's where it throws them. 
you know, it's, it's like two completely different sensibilities. And some people have a hard time seeing what they can't see because they're thinking of words and you throw an image at them mm-hmm. or you throw something, a symbol at them in right. that respect. And it's not a surprise also that Luther and the gang, especially with the rise of the printing press, the Reformation could only happen because the printing press yeah, was invented, sure. is the fact well, you that... You know, Hilary Belloc, the, the English... Yes, Catholic author. He makes the point that the Reformation wouldn't have succeeded if it weren't for the English minds who sustained it, which is right. interesting. He so he basically makes the argument that the Continental Reformation was sort of dying out yeah. at the time when the English Reformation was really picking up steam and carried the the banner the rest of the way. Mm-hmm. And then they did it through word. Word. So yeah, it just makes me think. I wonder if that's that's part of it because if England was such a word based culture. Yeah. And they had the words to sustain it, maybe. Yeah. That and as sense. a form of communication. And then it's not a surprise that you would have then symbols that aren't merely symbols, the Eucharist, other things, sacraments, right. Right. that are reduced to like a symbol on a to page, symbols, yeah. much like letters and everything else. Right. They've reduced it back to, they couldn't accept it as something yeah. beyond a written reality. They had to turn it into something that you could, in a sense, put on a page or, the, or, you know, maybe, maybe not quite as severely. There's a lot of that, the, the complete reduction to symbols, but, or they just strip it of all of its sort of corporeal realness and they just want to write it off as a spiritual reality. Right. Right. So, yeah, yeah. It, it's, and, and that's the thing that threw me. I mean, it was one of the things that I think in my journey, it kind of, we have all the, the words mm-hmm. in the Anglican, right. And yet, I actually heard people that I thought knew better saying, well, if you don't want to believe it's body and blood of Christ, you don't have to. No, no. That it's, that it's what it is when you receive, it's what you believe that it is. And it's through me. I could not fathom how they'd say that it it either is or it isn't. Right. But to say, Oh, it's subjective. It's completely subjective. It's it's based on what you want it to be when you receive it. I mean, I've got a glass of water here. Right. And no matter how much I want to believe that it's wine, it is, it's, it's water. water. Yep. You're not so. going to change that reality on your own. Right. Two weeks ago, uh, a friend of mine and I did a, a, a an episode on the real presence. Mm-hmm. And one of the things we talked about is how this receptionist idea that it is what you believe it is. You know, that the, the real presence of Christ is there spiritually to the receiver who believes it's there. Yeah. That in some way conditions the action of God on your action right well, it's like, all about me yeah exactly so yeah i'm my own pope and i can be my own god so jesus is only there if i believe he's there yeah, if i how, choose how does that make any sense if i choose yeah well and, and and it's funny it traces back i remember one of the few writing classes i ever took in college back in the 70s and i remember writing this piece that the teacher then decided to read aloud in class and then ask the class okay what do you think this means and they all came up with things that had nothing to do with what I actually wrote. <laughs> Perfect. And finally, I raised my hand and I said, okay, at what point do I get to explain that none of these actually are correct? That's not here's what, I what Here's what I was writing. And she stopped me. And she said, what you intended is not important. Right, exactly. This it's is, what they received. This is the sort of deconstructionist approach to yeah. understanding reality. Yeah, so the complete breakdown of it is if I choose to believe. Well, we're seeing the end result of that now, aren't we? Yeah. If I choose to believe that I'm a hedgehog, who are you to tell me that I'm not really a hedgehog? I mean, the reality has become an unreality, and it's all based on the individual. It's consumerism going crazy. Right. You know, I mean, it's Burger King. Yeah. Have it your way. Yeah. Everything. I can have it my way. Sort of. Right. But not really. <laughs> Well, let's pivot once more. I want to wrap this conversation up by talking about some of these things that you mentioned are passions of yours because, and I think I share these passions as well. It's why I have this podcast called Credo mm. Catholic, where I'm trying to help Catholics think through their faith and help uh, catechize and all of that. And I know this is a passion of yours, primarily through your work with the Augustine Institute, which we mm. haven't mentioned, but the Augustine Institute is a Denver, Colorado based apostolate that does publications. They're also a uh, a seminary, not a religious seminary, but a lay seminary where you can go to get graduate degrees, mm-hmm. distance, and in residence. And they run forms.org, which many of our listeners may have seen in their mm-hmm. parish bulletins. Lots of great material on there, some of it written by you. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but you are the, uh, you're, you're kind of their their digital content, audio content, written content guru over there. So you're writing books with them. Well, yeah, it's, and, and I'll, I'll narrow it down because I'm not writing everything, but 
uh, quite a bit, but sure. it's mostly story. So after all those years of doing dramas and doing novels and doing screenplays or whatever for the evangelical Protestant community, when I was received into the church, my first question was, I wonder if I can do for the Catholic community what I've been doing for the evangelical community. And initially the answer was no. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there was always the assent from publishers and from people who were in authority, uh, uh, the power of story. Yes, we need we need to uh, teach the truth from the church through story, but uh, not right now. We've got other things we're doing ahead of that. Well, and we it, don't it, even know that anybody will buy it. Yeah, anyway. and and the the publishing scene, as I understand it, at least you know, sort of outsider looking in. It seems like the, the publishing opportunities, the publishing scene is much smaller in the Catholic world than oh, it is in the Oh, yeah, and, and that's a whole other reality. Yeah. And, and that's where Dr. Tim Gray and the Augustine Institute is way ahead of the curve. Um, and I'll just say it simply. One of the biggest differences that I noticed between Catholic and Protestant was that um, Protestant is lifestyle-based. Mm. You know that, yep. as I do. Everything from books, a plethora of publishers, music industry— yep online stuff, even down to refrigerator magnets with Bible verses and cute kittens on them. I mean, yep. there is a whole industry and Bumper I'm not saying it's, magnets. yeah. And I'm not saying it's cynically. I sure. mean, because Protestants are taught that church is not the primary focus that you take your personal spiritual life home right, and you play out at home and you watch things that are Christian, you feed yourself with Christian things and so the whole subculture, the industry, the entertainment industry in the Protestant reality is completely different from the Catholic reality. The Catholic reality is event-based, to put it crudely, mm -hmm. sacramentally, mm -hmm. and church-based. So you have a generation more than that, uh, a percentage who are highly engaged Catholics, and that's a small, let's just do the mythical 7%. Yeah. But the rest of engaged Catholics to some degree, not highly engaged, but engaged, they're pretty much doing church. They're going to Mass on Sunday, and they might be involved in something else, maybe Knights of Columbus or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, but when they get home, apart from a crucifix on the wall, apart from maybe a few things that would remind them that they're Catholic, they're not thinking that they need it because yeah. they go to Mass. They right. go to church. So there isn't, I mean, the highly engaged Catholics might have an altar. They might have, mm -hmm. you know, some something that they would use to help them with prayers, evening prayers, whatever they're doing. But apart from that, you don't have the subculture or the industry to support and supplement a Catholic life at home. And so that's why uh, you, you noticed, I mean... You've got a handful of publishers, Ignatius and others, yep. Ignatius, who are trying to. And there's a couple others. Yeah, right? and, and, and uh, Sophia and, and yep. some of the Atan books and some of the others. And they're doing catechetical and they're doing devotional books and things like that. Yeah. And, and, and they are doing a good work. So I'm not denigrating that at all. But, but it's but it's not like Thomas Nelson or Zondervan that has like Christ, oh, Christian novels, huge. you know, Frank, oh, yeah. Frank Peretti thrillers. And yeah. Stuff like that. I mean, uh, my joke was I want, I'd love to write stories for the Catholic community. But I'm going to have to change my name to Michael O'Brien to do it, because as far <laughs> as I could tell, guy, he right? was like the only novelist that was Great being published by, by anybody. I love O'Brien. So, so um, I, I waited. <laughs> I, I just kept thinking, well, you know, I'll continue my work and focus on the family. Yeah. Until God clearly gives me marching orders, this is where I am. Yeah. Live out my faith and and do it and pray for the church that the catechism will get better or that something will change. And what changed was Dr. Tim Gray and the Augustine Institute. It had been 10 years, uh, a lay graduate school. Right. And then they created a program called Symbolon, which was a very high quality, uh, much like, um, well, now Bishop Barron's um, uh, Catholicism, yep. which I think triggered it. They said, well, we can do that. Yeah. And so. Our, our church uses Symbolon for the RCIA course. Right. And, and it's it's wonderful. Yeah. It's, so Dr. Gray is a visionary uh, and, and in a very evangelical way. Mm-hmm. Because he contacted me and we began to talk and it became clear that he wanted to do lots of things. Uh, Formed was just coming and he had tons of other videos he wanted to produce and he wanted to do audio drama. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying, but we don't know that the Catholic community wants audio drama. I don't even know that they know what it is. Right. And he said, 
yeah, but we'll show them. They'll hear it and then they'll want it's it. Like the, uh, it's the Steve Jobs approach to the iPhone. Well, right? what it sort of is, or that, yeah, if you build it, they will come. And he's been like that in all these areas. Yeah. And I remember early on saying, but Tim, you do understand you are, you're not just pushing like new product and new ways to teach catechism. You are actually pushing the Catholic community from this event-based reality and the parish-based reality. You are now moving into lifestyle. You are pushing a Catholic community into doing this stuff at home. Right. That's a new model. And that's a whole new model, which said, you know, and, and the, the good news and the bad news is, the good news is you're doing it. The bad news is you might become the example of someone who tried it and failed. Yeah. But so far he hasn't failed. We have pushed aggressively into all of these new areas, believing that Catholics want to engage. And now we're giving them the means to do it. Well, it seems like they've been received well. The St. Francis audio drama got an Audi award, right? Well, yeah, that was a secular award, which was very gratifying, yeah. told us we're doing something right. And then your newest one is Robin Hood? Uh, right? The Legends of Robin Hood. So okay. we did, um, yeah, we did um, Brother Francis about yep. Francis of Assisi. We did The Trials of St. Patrick to tell his story. Uh, Ode to St. Cecilia That's right, to yeah. tell her story. And now The Legends of Robin Hood. So we had three saints and now uh, not really a saint, but. I called him a saintly outlaw. Sure, yeah, and um, and they're they're doing well. I think people, as they hear them, get engaged, and now they're understanding what we mean by audio drama. Some, I mean, you had people, a lot of Catholics, New Adventures and Odyssey, but now that we're moving in those directions, now I'm I'm writing novels. I'm doing novels for the Augustine Institute, so I'm the story guy. Yeah, basically, when I go into meetings and we're talking catechism, we're talking about what we're doing. My question will always be, What's the story? where are the stories? Yeah. How do I tell stories for that age group that will help make the catechism, the teaching more meaningful at that deeper level, much like Jesus did. Mm -hmm. You know, he had his proclamations and he said what he had to say. Yep. And he went, oh, and by the way, Here's a parable. There was, yeah, there was a man who had two sons yeah. or uh, whatever the story was, which often we remember more than we do. I, I would say al almost always, right? Yeah. If you say good Samaritan. Yeah. People will know what you're talking about. And it's about. because stories engage that empathic region of our brain that yeah. helps us connect with the truth. We connect, it gives us meaning, it goes deeper. Yeah. Sometimes it's a time bomb. Eugene Peterson called it that. He he said the parables were like time bombs. People are going, oh, he's telling a story. Great. We'll listen to a story. And it doesn't even seem to be religious. That's even better. And then a oh. week later, two weeks later, a year later, they're going, wait a minute. Yeah. You know, God is the father and I'm the prodigal son or whatever the yeah. case may be. So I love story for that reason. I think 30 years of adventures and odyssey and its impact has proven it. Uh, when I talk to you and your wife and I talk to others who grew up and they are still believers. Oh yeah. <laughs> Sometimes sure. I have to ask, did you, uh, when pe people go, Oh, my kids grew up on adventures and odyssey. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, they're 30, 40 years old now, <laughs> which makes me feel old. Yeah. And then I say now, are they, are they still, still believers yeah. or are they in therapy or whatever? Yeah, Cause yeah. I just think, Oh, did, did, did we derail somebody right. somewhere along the way unintentionally? But, um, I, I love the idea that the same Holy spirit that inspires us to do what we do is the same Holy spirit that is at work in listeners and yeah. in the readers and the people who are on the receiving end yeah. and to trust that, uh, you know, cause the evangelical, I've always laughed that the evangelical approach would be, you know, you and I live within sight of Pike's Peak. <laughs> right. You know, and all nature speaks of the glory of God. And God even risks the fact that somebody's going to look at that mountain and worship the mountain mm -hmm. or go down to Manitou Springs and worship something else. Actually, just yesterday, I don't know if you saw this, Union Seminary had a, held a little service where uh, people confessed to plants and ask their forgiveness for Did they? for violating. Oh, well, sweet. <laughs> I can't even tell the story without laughing about <laughs> well, it. It was so ridiculous. Yes, I'm so... <clears throat> Sorry, but, <laughs> but, but I was laughing because the evangelical approach where a Catholic approach would be, look at the beauty of the mountain, it points to God. The evangelical approach is, we got to put John 3.16 on the side mm. of that mountain or they're mm. not going to get it. And Yeah, that, that is that's interesting what I love because, about being Catholic. I mean, having grown up in the sort of evangelical subculture, I, I agree with that, that, you know, I, I, for example, listen to a lot of Christian music, contemporary Christian music. Sure. And the whole idea behind contemporary Christian music or CCM, as they, as they say, is it's, it's, a Christianized version of something that already exists in secular society. Yeah. And so the tendency is not to say, how does the gospel permeate all of society and transform all of it? But rather we have the gospel. How do we 
set up our para society over here. Yeah. And, and, and we're know, like the shadow of, cabinet yeah, in, exactly. in a government. Exactly. We're basically a replica of something else, which was again, an evangelistic tool. Right. So it's like, well, wait a minute, everybody's listening to Mariah Carey. So mm-hmm. let's do a Christian Mariah Carey. Exactly. Uh, everybody's Rachel listening Lampa. to rap. Let's do DC talk. Let's do, you know, and, and fortunately, if you go way back into the early seventies, the Jesus movement and a lot of that music and, and you listen to it and you go, wait a minute, they, they just ripped that off of Simon and Garfunkel. Oh, totally. And now yeah, they're trying absolutely. to be the Beatles here and they're trying to be this. Yep. Um, if nothing else, at least the quality went up that whatever they were producing, they began to use really good musicians. Yeah, yeah. So they, whatever they were producing was good and it wasn't embarrassing. And that's one of the things about the Augustine Institute, because it's not enough to produce it. One of our mandates is to do the highest quality possible because it's the quality that inspires. I mean, you can tell a story and that can be inspiring unto itself. But when you're telling a story or when you're producing a video series or audio, or whatever it may be, yeah. if you do it and do it really well, even if people are rejected, they say that's always been my argument, Catholic or Protestant, mm-hmm. was very often when people go, oh yeah, well, I made this movie and you know the secular culture just rejected it. And then you watch the movie and go, I don't think they rejected it because of the message. Right. They rejected it because it's a bad movie. <laughs> yeah. And we have so many dramatized sermons right now that are out there as movies. And you want to say, if you'd actually done it well, I think you might have had a different reaction. Yeah, totally. Then they're rejecting the message. And that's a different different thing. So what we're trying to produce and what I'm working on would be, to the best of my ability, uh, to create high-quality stories, stories that would, would stand scrutiny by somebody secular in terms of character and structure and what I'm doing, uh, so that the messages will get through the way Jesus took, got messages through his story. Yeah, I, I think that's really good. And when I hear you frame it that way, sort of rejecting the message versus rejecting the the medium or the quality, I think it's a lot harder to reject a message because messages are complex and multifaceted and it takes time to work through them. Mm-hmm. And so if you have a, a complicated message and or a very important message like the gospel, you maximize your chance of getting people to engage with it if you tell a good story because if you're not telling a good story if, if you know the brother francis audio drama is really bad quality they're going to turn it off right. 10, 10 minutes in and be like i'm right. done with this right and the message isn't going to be obvious anyway because right. uh, it may sound strange for me to say after 30 years of working with adventures and odyssey which was essentially a teaching program mm-hmm. but if you listen to the show and the arc of the show you hear how we kept trying to work towards teaching without anyone feeling like they're being taught yeah uh, and and I don't want to say burying it or it's not disguising it. It's all there. We weren't hiding what it was we were trying to do, but we realized that you have to have a good story. You have to have compelling characters. You have to have quality production. Uh, you don't want to bank on your audience forgiving you for your deficiencies. Or actually, as a writer, I also concluded that while God can redeem our worst efforts. We shouldn't keep putting him in a position where he has yes, to. That's very true. Yeah, we can't use that as an excuse. So yeah. we always have to aspire because people are drawn towards quality. They're drawn towards beauty uh, as as a means to get to truth. Uh, Bishop Barron said that not too long ago. Mm-hmm. The common language we might have would be beauty, beauty in art, beauty in uh, in in the craft of what we do. Right, and that will be an enticement that'll draw people in. And it gives them a fighting chance to pick up on whatever the messages might be, the themes that we're exploring. But we, I, I'm afraid that we've got a couple of generations that have lost how to do that. That we as Catholics can be as clunky as, as Protestants when it comes to using art as an evangelistic tool. Yeah. Rather than using art as art and allowing things to communicate through artistry and, and trust that people will get it whether they're looking at a great painting or watching a well-done movie or reading a novel or whatever the case right. may be. So to, to take this full circle as a final question before we wrap up here, what would you say to the Catholic who's listening, who attends a parish that, um, you know, let's say maybe, maybe the homiletics are a little bit of a struggle on Sundays. The pastor is a good and holy man, but doesn't preach very well. Maybe the life of the parish lacks vitality because people don't, understand and engage with the gospel what, what are some ways that catholics can encourage their parishes or their fellow catholics to 
engage better with these marvelous stories and in, in so doing engage more with God. Well, I think, I mean, when it comes to being in a parish where oh, I, I had never thought of, um, I never thought mass was supposed to be a purgative experience, right. but very often it can it, be. It certainly can es- be. Especially if you have aesthetic senses, um, yeah. you know, uh, by if, way if, of the if, music, by way right. of homily, all the right, things right. you described. And the number one thing to do is is pray. Mm. You know, we, we need to pray for our people and pray that God will also bring into the fold the artists, the people with this music sensibilities. Because you ask most people what they think of the choir, and they're fine. Um, in fact, I wanted to do a book. One, one of the things I learned about Catholic versus other types of things, and this was a study done by somebody who who's drew the conclusion that the problem in most Catholic churches is that unlike many Protestant organizations and businesses, mm-hmm. um, there is not really a desire for excellence. Good enough is good enough. Right. And I was thinking I want to do a book called Good Enough is Not Good Enough. I like it. I love it. And, and the other is there's a lack of desire for continuing education. And when you think of the structure, oh, it doesn't allow for it. I mean, my church experience in a Baptist church was you came, you got there at 915 for Sunday school. That was a given. And then you went to 11 o'clock service. They were bundled together. You right. didn't have them detached. You didn't have your Bible study on another night that then meant you had to work that much harder to get to it. Right. So I, I think if somebody's in a frustrating situation, um, I mean, nowadays Catholics always have the option of going to a different parish than the one nearest to them. Um, but uh, that's unfortunate. We don't want to become a bunch of church, church shoppers. shoppers. Yeah. And, and there's some danger, quite a bit of danger to that. Um, but pray for the leadership and establish enough credibility to speak into the situation. And I, I, I say that very carefully because very often it's easy for anybody to want to go in and just complain to change things, but there's no credibility to it. I can walk into any church and just go, you know, you really ought to do this differently. Mm-hmm. And they would rightfully look at me and go, I'm sorry, who, who are, are you? you? <laughs> I, I'm sorry. You, you just came last Sunday, right? Uh, you know, anybody can come in, but when you go into a parish and the leadership knows you're involved, they know that you're thinking of its best interest, not just changing it into your image. You're in there because you care about the parish and you're participating and you're engaging at, a, at, at that level. Then you establish the credibility when you say to somebody, have you thought about this? What would it take to change that? Has anybody? Then you have a fighting chance of doing it. But I think foundationally our struggle is we, we have pastors and we have a lot of people in church leadership who don't know what they don't know. Mm-hmm. They don't know aesthetics. They don't know what beautiful, holy architecture is. They don't know that the choir is singing some song, but they may not all be singing the same song. Right. Uh, I, I mean, in the homilies, uh, there's a neutralization among clergy, in fact, and I learned that the hard way, that even among pastors who have new priests working with them, there is a complete reticence to ever critique Not sermons. a lot of feedback for homiletics. And, and they yeah. won't do it. It's not that they don't want to, but they won't do it. They just, it's not done, is sort of, to use the British it's phrase. So it's simply yeah. not done. Yeah, we just don't do that here. And, and I find that's unfortunate, because I think the more experienced pastors need to diplomatically talk to new priests, young priests, and say, here's the way to do this. Yeah. And, and you know, when you said that, it didn't connect or might right, not right, have connected. Sure. To, to do a, a who, gently who feedback, helpful right? corrective yeah. thing. So um, I wish there were easy answers. I wish yeah. there was an easy fix. And every parish is different. I mean, the parishes just here in Colorado Springs is an example. Very widely. They are varied, all yeah. so different. And, um, and I'm sure that's true in every town or every city. No doubt. So I do respect Catholics who say, well, this is my parish and I'm going to be here. Mm-hmm. And whether I like this or don't like this, and that's good. They're not church hopping. But at the same time, I would yearn for us as Catholics to reclaim 2,000 years of beauty in the truth that we're presenting and to present that truth really well. I absolutely agree. And I'll just add two quick comments to your very good ones already. The first is that 
I, I don't ever want any Catholic being discouraged from going to mass because it is purgative as you, as right. you described, you know, it's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's, it's hard if you're a musician <laughs> to go and listen to a, right. a choir that is, uh, you know, making a joyful noise unto the Lord, but it's more noise than joy. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's really hard to, to be someone who is articulate in your own words and values catechesis and then go listen to a, an excruciatingly bad and overly long or trite homily. But that's not why we go to mass. And so remind yourself of that whenever you're tempted to think, this is so awful. I have to go to mass again today and listen to that choir. You know, just just try to ignore the choir if it, if it bothers well, you. Well, at much. the end of it, it is it comes down to uh, it's the Eucharist. We're there right. for the Eucharist. Exactly. That's the center point, the unlike the, the Protestant summit. thing. And and the other thing I would say to leadership would be, you know, if you can't do it well, you don't have to do it. That's true. Yeah. You know, uh, don't make the mass your rehearsal. <laughs> yeah. Okay. If uh, get the choir to a particular point, then let them do what they yeah. do. And I know there's that sense of volunteerism. You hate to discourage people. Mm-hmm. Oh, she, she doesn't sing well, but you know, her she heart's in the right place. A <laughs> it's a shame. Her voice just isn't anywhere near <laughs> as good as her heart is. But, uh, that's would be the other thing. I think pastorally helping people discover where their gifts fit into the church is good. Yeah. Right. Because we do them a disservice when we allow people who yeah. are not gifted in certain areas to per- true. persist in doing things. Yeah, I mean, why would you why would you let a bad catechist do your catechesis? Right. Yeah. So Except in sympathy to the pastor, it's the only person who stepped sure. forward. Well, you that, can't get a good catechist. And that's that's a great point because the second thing I was going to say is get involved and get involved beyond going to Sunday mass, you know, mm-hmm. go to Sunday mass, go to daily mass. If you're a musician, sign up for the choir or, or, you know, sign up to play an instrument right. in your church. But if, not as a showcase for your ability. Certainly not. That's the other thing. Cause I yeah. have talked to Protestants who became Catholic and it's like, they want their moment to shine. Mm. They want to be a cantor because got to have their solo. You know, the, it's, it's their chance. Cause they were used to that. And the were, Protestant they were, thing. they were in the praise band yeah, and they were yeah. used to being in the spotlight with the microphone. And the idea is, uh, I'm a dramatist, and I started by creating church dramas at Grace Baptist Church, but not for the services. Right. It was never in my mind that these dramas were supposed to supplant or be an addendum, especially in the Catholic sense with the Mass. Mm -hmm. Mass is what it is. So then I have to think, okay, where else can I write drama, use those talents, if it's allowable within the church to try to do that? if it's the right time in the right place. Right. Um, so that's the other thing. Bring your talents to bear, but do it humbly. Mm-hmm. Do it with, not that you're going to reshape the mass into your own image, but that um, it's shaping us and and we figure out where, where we fit. And I, I struggled with that after I became Catholic. I wound up, I remember going to confession and I was still working at Focus on the Family and I just had a week where I, I was really bristling over the fact that I was Catholic, had been Catholic for a few years, and just wanted to do something for the Catholic community more directly. And I remember going to confession. I talked to the priest, and he said, well, let me let me just check this. It sounds to me like you're really bristling because you're sitting on a fence, and you really want to be more outspoken, and you want to you know, do things with your Catholicism that right now you're not able to do. And he said, now, unless I'm mishearing you, God is not giving you marching in, any marching orders. Because mm. if he has, that's a different thing. So it sounds to me like you're not really on a fence. You're sitting on a bridge. Mm. And that you being where you are allows you to show the truth of the Catholic Church to people who wouldn't otherwise see it. So I suggest that you re- relax and find peace in where you are until God gives you your marching orders to, to go somewhere else. And I think that's a big part of our frustrations we know the potential we know what something could or should be and then we get all bristly about it and then we lose our sense of peace Mm -hmm. and when we lose our sense of peace in our parish when we're talking to the pastor at the parish or somebody who might be able to make changes what they get is our anxiety they get our demands and they don't get a sense from us that we're coming from a place of peace and of a desire to help at the right level and what's appropriate for the parish, if that makes any sense. That makes that makes a lot of sense, yeah. And I think that's a great way to end. So, Paul, I want to thank you for coming by and chatting with me tonight. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'd love to have you back on sometime again soon sure. if you if you'd be up for that. I think it was a really interesting conversation. And as we close, where can my listeners find more of your work? 
Um, well, with the Augustine Institute, um, we are at augustineinstitute.org, um, formed, has a lot of the stuff. Um, airtheater.org, A-I-R-T-H-E-A-T-R-E, or I, actually, I think we did both, E-R at the Okay, end. good, got it. So yeah. airtheater.org might air redirect is... to the Augustine Institute site, and that's where the audio dramas are. The kids' uh, novels that I'm doing now are there. Uh, I'm developing, I didn't really talk about the bigger picture of this Hope Springs universe, a, a Colorado town called Hope Springs. Mm-hmm. Um, that I've tried to create in the context of the Augustine Institute so I can tell stories to any age group. Oh, that's great. So I have like the preschool stories that I can tell through one thing called The Toy Closet, these six books for first readers called The Adventures of Nick and Sam. I'm now, as of today, the first in a series of books for 10, 11, 12-year-olds. Oh, cool. Uh, called The Virtue Chronicles has just come out. Nice. And there's also a grown-up novel called Blue Christmas um, so I've tried to create, it's like Marvel universe, but they're all interconnected, but you can read any one of them or engage at any place Standalone, yeah. and you're fine with it. That's great. But there'll be little things that will overlap with other things. So it's almost like Odyssey, but a little more expansive because you can yeah, target the different age. Yeah. Groups. Because of all the different age groups yeah. and, and I've developed it. I mean, Odyssey in many ways made things up as we went along sure. as opportunities came up. Well, it was where I mean, now I'm trying to be intentional Yeah, that before makes sense. we started anything I knew roughly what I could do and how I was going to interconnect things yeah. as needed. So it's a complete world as opposed to uh, fragments. Well, and what a blessing that with this background sort of standing up and pioneering Odyssey, you can now take all of those lessons learned and do that for the church. Mm-hmm. So. And it's very exciting because I feel like it's starting over again, but yeah. in a good way. It's, it's very exciting. It's got that energy of, yeah. of being at the start of something that I, I think is important. Well, great. Well, thank you so much once yep. again for coming thank by. Thank you, Zach. To our listeners, if you want to hear more, you can reach out to me, creedalcatholic at vernacularpodcast.com. If you have questions for uh, Paul, I will pass them on to him and yep. uh, give you give him your contact information. So once again, creedalcatholic at vernacularpodcast.com. And we'll be back next week for another episode. God bless you. All right. Thank you so much for tuning into part two of my interview with Paul McCusker. You can reach out to me, Credo Catholic at vernacularpodcast.com. If you have comments or questions for Paul, I'll be sure to pass those along. If you have comments or questions for me, I'll be sure to review those and would love to uh, talk about uh, some of the emails I receive on the show. So send me an email, Credo Catholic at vernacularpodcast.com. Thank you so much for listening. Please give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts if you have not done so already. But in the meantime, just thank you for listening and for being a part of this. Uh, I, we're, we're growing, and I'm really excited about reaching more people with this content. So please continue to listen and tell your friends about this as well. Thank you so much. God bless you.